heard of my organization, that's a mean math buddy. How many of you are not on the mean math buddy? Just email me. Right? Proof is in the pudding. Um, and so what we've tried to do certainly is not exclude anyone. We want everyone's participation. And those of us who are involved on the ground floor of this organization have tried to reach out to as many people as we know. We're building a database. We're building lists. We're reaching out. And so right now, uh, we're doing our best with the list that we have. But our organization is open to everybody who wants to be a member. And um, I just reiterate that today. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, when we first started, the first thing we did was we tried to, um, can you hear me? Uh, we tried to uh, reach out to people in Egypt. That was probably our first, our first, mm -hmm. as well as, as some uh, who would be mentors here in the U.S. And we found, the, the what we found are people in Egypt are really eager to collaborate with Egyptian Americans. They really want to. It, it, in spite of what some might think, and I heard this before we started the effort, is that people in Egypt aren't going to trust us. Or they're they're going to think that we don't have... Um, we, we shouldn't have a say in anything because we, we've left Egypt. But it's not true. They, they actually value our contribution. So that, that was, you know, and then, and then I found that they were almost more eager to work with us than some people here. <laughs> so, um, that's what that's Somebody can elaborate a little bit on how you actually reached out to people in Egypt. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're here right now. And like during my trip, like a few days ago, while I was there, I found that it's just being here, it's just so difficult for me to get a sense of what is going on on the ground. So it's interesting to learn about how such organizations <coughs> can reach out to people there. Anybody? Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, it is very, very difficult to know what's happening, especially when the situation is as fluid as it is. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you, actually, as an analyst, it's very difficult to write anything on Egypt uh, because it's overtaken by events within a matter of hours. Um, but I think one way that we uh, that we use, I mean, certainly um, as an organization, Erla has taken a couple trips to Egypt, um, and we found that even though we've been there twice in the past uh, past year, um, it, it, we really know very little based on you know coming from those trips alone. So we rely on our partners, um, but one informal way is one that Rhonda mentioned, and that is I think we all, to a certain extent, rely on our relatives. Uh, for information. I know I use my family as sort of an informal focus group uh, of, of public opinion um, because I have a whole range, I'm sure like so many other uh, Egyptian Americans, I have a whole range in my family. Uh, minus the food. I have no food in my family. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Uh, Everybody so I, does. I, 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 not uh, I, I have his kind of a but I don't. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On this point? Yes. On this point? Yes. yes. Okay, please go ahead. My, I'm with the uh, Alliance of Egyptian American. Uh -huh. That's uh, the oldest organization here, six years old. And we really have work in Egypt. We, we have people in Egypt, we have a, a chapter in Egypt, uh -huh. and we communicate with the politician before the revolution and during and now, until now. Then we are dealing with them. And also we formed a coalition mm -hmm. of Egyptian organizations in 2009, and we communicate direct with President uh, Mubarak, with President Obama. Uh, President Mubarak never responded to us, neither Obama, <laughs> ne neither Obama, but we made the noise, and we, we know our voice was heard. Mm -hmm. Then we active as an eight organization working together, and I hope Sharif, I didn't hear about his organization, and he's here in Virginia, we here, we, we have a coalition, we have a group. Our problem is a database and will continue to be the problem, a database. If we form it, everybody will hear about us. And I think and this is an excellent, an excellent venue to develop a database, to start coordinating and learning about one another, and maybe somebody can take up this project. Sure. I think we, somebody had taken up a similar project last year during the, um, the Together for a New Egypt project. I'm not sure what the situation is regarding that, but I think this is quite essential, right? Is this dead, you say? I uh, was oh. involved with that group, but nothing happened since. So maybe this is something that we can spark up again and sure. sort of infuse some dynamism, dynamism into it. Thank you. Thank sure. you, Dr. Amin. So um, can I answer the other 
part of the er earlier question? Yeah. Okay. So, um, as, as Sally uh, said, a lot of things happen specifically. You want to know what's going on in terms of interfaith dialogue. It's a lot of an antidote. Uh, you have to ask someone, and, they'll, and um, you're not really. Um, th things do happen. They oftentimes people don't have the technical skills to be able to continue the dialogue. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, we had a meeting. We had uh, women, Christian and Muslim women meet and we met in someone's house twice. And then they really didn't know what to do after that. And one of the things that I, I um, see where Egyptian Americans can help is that we have experience living in a pluralistic society. We might not all have exactly the technical skills, but we have experience. And so in our many visits, I mean, the amount of travel that Egyptian Americans do, there is opportunity to, before you go, create a connection, set up something, and actually maybe conduct uh, some kind of a dialogue using materials that have been uh, created. There's tons and tons of available materials. So I'm just going to give that as, you know, a potential suggestion. Maybe during the breakout sessions later on, you can talk to the people who are interested in this kind of work and let them know a little bit about more concrete steps they can follow sure. and or can join what you're doing right now. Any other questions on this point? Oh, this plenty. Okay. Um, sir, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my question, uh, are you guys all uh, these organizations, are you going to really have a concrete plans uh, on working how to get this community together, how to really get the Egyptians together? Because we are, we are, that's the biggest thing we are missing. We really need to get together. Mm -hmm. We want to know each other. We want to know how can we, because everyone can do something <coughs> instead of uh, doing whatever, whatever the other person is doing. Well, maybe if the panelists don't have the direct answer to this, maybe we can all come up with it during this meeting and then develop complete steps. But afterwards, I'll, I'll try to if you help. Okay. Say peace. All right. So I, I've, I've lived in this country 40 years. I, I came here as a child, and I know many of you have, have lived longer. But my experience in studying other communities is that there are models. There, no, uh, one of the things I've seen the Egyptian community do is frustrate itself trying to create a single entity. I don't know that that's possible. Other uh, models of uh, ethnic communities or religious communities or, or purpose, communities that have purpose, come together under umbrella organizations. So for example, if we take a look at the American Jewish community, there's an organization, a very powerful organization, called the Council of, Amer of Presidents of American Jewish Organizations. It's just presidents of the organizations. And there you are, the model is we are entities doing different things, but for uh, uh, purposes where we have something in common, our presidents come together and do things. There are other organizations that, and other um, models where people have a <coughs> umbrella body, a coalition body for specific purposes only. Um, Rhonda talked about that. And it, you know, one of the things she's talking about in many ways is that for single purposes, we may be able to come together. For other purposes, you know, we can do our, you know, we can do uh, continue on our own separate efforts. So. If I can just follow up on that, I'll tell a personal story. In uh, 1994, I moved to the state of Michigan to organize the Arab American community politically for a man named Spencer Abraham, who was a Lebanese American running for the United States Senate in Michigan. And I moved up to Michigan, and the first thing I asked for was lists. So if anybody have any lists, I need to build up a database. And it became readily apparent to me that the Lebanese Christians hated the Lebanese Muslims, who hated the Yemenis, who hated the Egyptians, who hated the, you know, on and on and on, rivalries among the Chaldeans and the this one and the that one. And what I finally said to them is, I'm no Nasser. This is not about pan-Arabism here. I, want, I don't want to get you along. I'm not here to bring you all together. You can continue to fight. But I want you to do one thing, and one thing only in common, and that's vote for Spencer Abraham, the Arab American running for Senate. And you know what? They did it. And because of him, because of them, he was elected to the United States Senate in a year when you know, no Republican ever had ever won Michigan for the United States Senate in some 25 years. So playing off to what Sahar says, you know what? You know, some people have rivalries. You know, they're going back in our community. And this isn't about one organization better than the other. This is about getting everybody to go and walk in the same direction and do one thing and one thing in common. Thank you very much for this, Rhonda. Thank you. Please, sir. 
انا اسمي ابراهيم حسين انا عضو في الاتحاد الله اتكلم عربي ولا انجليزي؟ انجليزي انا 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 We had demonstrations in the front of the White House denouncing Mubarak and Mubarak himself heard us. Mm -hmm. We de demonstrated, we had a 10 point plan about what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also, when uh, Sharif was in the guy, Zanjia was murdered, we had a demonstration, we have been active. We have a 10 point plan, 2007, about what we need to do. I don't mean to hate you. Just to notice, the alliance was not mentioned. It is the oldest, and I believe it has most members, the most chapters have been around before, way before the revolution. And I'd like it to be recognized. The other point I'd like to say is what Sharif Fahmi said. Sharif, you said that we need uh, a hub or a director. I'm not saying that everybody should fall under one organization or, or this sort. But we need a way to communicate with each other, mm -hmm. to coordinate our work. All of us, we may have, I believe we have agreement in about 80% of what we want to do for us. Some of us have some other things that others may not yeah. agree with. Mm -hmm. But we need to find a way to come up with this hub or the directory, how to communicate with each other. When we go to the State Department, the White House, to speak on behalf of the real true revolution in Egypt, the first thing they ask, how many members do you have? Mm -hmm. How many organizations do you represent? If we go to Senator McCain and say we are representing 17 Egyptian American organizations, they will listen to us. Mm -hmm. But if I say we are representing of 250 members of the Alliance of Egyptian American, they will say, all right, thank you. Talk to my office manager. And yes. they, they will yes. dismiss it. Yes. So we, if we want to carry weight, we need to lobby on behalf of revolution in Egypt, and we need to coordinate our work in this country. The Egyptian American, the only group have this unique position. We are here and we care about them. We need to combine these and take advantage and have this. Yes, work. I think we're living a moment, and this is an yes. opportunity for us to start coalescing and sort of expanding. All the efforts have already been here since the 70s, as you said. Thank you for raising this point. Professor Owens, please. Thank you for giving me the floor. I just wanted to propose uh, uh, something very simple. But simplicity is uh, a sign of maturity. The simple solution here in this regard, as I see there are so many Egyptian American organizations now. Mm -hmm many in many different parts of the country, West Coast and Midwest yeah. and, and, and the East Coast. And I propose particularly to Randa, I know that she has more on her sugar that she can uh, carry, but I propose to Randa to, I propose to Randa to have uh, a website that would include all Egyptian American organizations so that they get to know one another and they can strengthen one another. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter even if our, an organization is a one person organization, it doesn't matter. But uh, every person is motivated to help a cause, and this is a great cause. So that is my proposal is to have an umbrella organization under which many of the Egyptian American uh, organizations are listed. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Professor, for this suggestion. And I think the purpose is rather than sort of start creating new organizations and new structures, we can start coalescing under umbrellas that already exist and the idea of having one common website where we can all learn about one another with links to all the organizations out there is a wonderful suggestion. Thank you, Professor. Um, last question on this point, please. Go ahead. Yes. I'm not sure where the mic is. Just turn it. So my name is Jason Stern, I'm a graduate student here at UW, 
And over the past year, I've had the privilege to get to know a lot of you. I know a lot of you work really hard and gain the right to vote in the elections. But the turnout for the public elections is very low. So I'm curious from the panelists, why was the turnout so low? And what did you learn so that when the presidential elections come up later this year, that it will be much higher? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think that, um, <clears throat> there, were, there were two issues with that, Jason, and I know we talked about it. One was our inability to communicate as an Egyptian-American community. Um, Kali, you're a good example. All your relatives in Chicago had no idea that they had to go to the consulate or the embassies if they didn't already have their ID cards. And there was a process, and you had to have your ID card in order to vote, but people were not aware. So there was a communication issue. The second issue was, to be very frank, it was a tedious issue. It was difficult. We lobbied and lobbied and lobbied the Egyptian embassy and the Egyptian government to bring that ID card delegation, and they brought it here. But when you went over there, it was, a, it was a very difficult procedure. You had to produce documents, you had to have, you know, in my case, I was born in the United States. My birth certificate had to be registered and translated in Arabic and then certified by an Egyptian judge. And I didn't know that till the day I got there. Uh, there was also, you know, a fee to be paid. So it was, uh, I know that the, that the Egyptian government was a little disappointed as well because I think they expected to see a higher turnout from America um, than was perhaps in other places around the world. Um, but I think it was the process and now, you know, again, people are trying to communicate with each other on various Facebook pages and otherwise, but it's really, it goes back to the original, we need one central location to communicate with the Egyptian American community. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I also recall that uh, the first round of elections, there was an email sent about what you needed to do about two days before, two days. And, they wanted, and they wanted it sent by like, to arrive the next day or something like that. Like the only way to do it would be to, to rush it via overnight mail or something like that. Um, that's one thing. And also, even if, if you got your ID, you wouldn't have been able to vote, which we did. We, we went in, we did all the paperwork. We had to wait until we're still hopefully voting. we'll be able to vote in the presidential election. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Shreve. Can I comment on that? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main problem also, they open the door to register to vote uh, late and they didn't give us a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Then it was announced late and then when they opened the day of election as the Sharif was talking about, was also like Thursday and we have to have it by Monday and the weekend and first, first time was everybody have to send to the embassy here and watch. Many people fly from California with the, with the mail, so, some of them, not everybody can do that. Uh, the people who send their uh, their ballot by mail never get here. Then it's a communication problem, and uh, part of the Egyptian government uh, fault. The website need to be strengthened to hold longer for any number of people when mm -hmm. they enter, which they can do that. They have very qualified people to do. Yes, maybe it was poorly planned. Maybe it's the first time around. We give sure. them the benefit of the right. doubt. Right. Maybe next time it's going to be a bit better. So, any other questions on this particular area on outreach to Egyptian Americans? Yeah. Yeah. You want to have a question? Yes. No, I have a question. I want to answer that. <laughs> oh, you want to? Okay. Yeah. Want to so, uh, so not not necessarily the concept of of voting for parliament, but as we know, you know. There are a lot of Egyptian Americans all over the country in small towns. My family is not in Chicago or Philadelphia. They're in a small town in Wisconsin when we moved there 40, 40 years ago. There's a, in that community, there's a good, you know, 50 Egyptian American families. They know very limited information. It would be very difficult to get to get information to them. So one of the, again, under the ethnic model of what has been successful in the United States is this concept of this regional um, organization. So uh, the, in, uh, the, again, the, uh, using the model of the Jewish American community, there are organizations called the Minnesota Association of Jewish Women. And that organization within the state of Minnesota or the state of Wisconsin, whatever it is, it has its own interests, its own, you know, it's, it creates its own relationships locally, etc. And what I'm advocating is very much the same thing. Communication does not have to be at the central point. Within the state of Delaware and the state, they can have their own Egyptian American information and each and each and every, um, you know, concept. I mean, I'm talking about uh, organizational structure that we need to re 
organizes a community, not, not in terms of organizations, but rethink how we can structure ourselves mm -hmm. on a big effort. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Can I have a question? A question? Yeah. I see that it's an open question to everyone. I believe in those actually three issues that uh, I've heard from the panel. One, uh, talk about synergy. Talk about website. I believe we need more synergy. What your ideas about synergy? Also, uh, Dr. Taman, she, she mentioned about the Egyptian, uh, Muslim, Christians, all these type of issues. Actually, she touched a very important point. Understanding the demographic here in the United States. Can you speak into the microphone? Okay. Thank you. Understanding the demographic here in the United States. Cops represent a major component. And I believe, till now, they are not really active in the political life uh, here in the United States. Till, till this point, uh, you Sorry, um, you cannot hear me? I'm not sure if they can hear you at the back. Is, is the is microphone on? on? It's on. It's on. It's on. Then maybe you have to project. Yeah. 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 All right. So <laughs> someone asked what your answer and what your opinion about synergy, building a real synergy between Egyptian and American organization, a real synergy, not the website, mm -hmm. more than that. Oh. Second question, how to involve Egyptian cops in the political life, in the mainstream, political life in the United States. Uh, one example, I met the president of cop lawyers, Egyptian cop lawyers, one of the best people I have ever seen uh -huh. here in the United States, and he's not involving in a mainstream political life here. Uh, the third issue is a database. I believe database, it should be a priority. Uh, I don't know, we don't have enough information. And that's an open question, how to involve Egyptian cops. Thank you. Anybody like to take up this? Um, I mean, I would say in terms of being inclusive in, in general, I would say if we build it, they'll come, right? If, if, if we do it and we do it well and we do it honestly, then I think people will get involved. But they have to know about it. And again, we keep sort of going back to the idea of a database, a website, a portal, of some place, central location where we can at least find out what's going on so we don't keep reinventing the wheel and we have similar efforts going on uh, in different places. I think one thing that we can do is to lead by example. Um, if we want to get cops involved, then tackle issues that cops care about. Tackle, if you want Salafis to get involved, tackle issues that Salafis care about. If we want to bring, draw people out from their isolation, then yeah. let's address the issues that they care most about and do it in an honest way. One thing that I am amazed that hasn't happened, uh, I'm not surprised it hasn't happened in Egypt, but, but especially after the, the church bombing last, mm -hmm. uh, last year, and I know there were a lot of different uh, who were anxious, wanting to help or do something in some way, and there were all these sort of disparate uh, initiatives off in different directions. But one thing that I thought could have happened, and maybe should have happened, is, and, and could still happen, is a town hall meeting of, of the community where we tackled the issue of the S word, sectarianism, uh, openly and honestly, because it's a reality, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of Egyptians still live in denial, including the ones, uh, and it's not just a river in Egypt, um, and including a lot of uh, Egyptian Americans uh, would rather sort of bury their heads in the sand than acknowledge that there is an issue, uh, and there is a very serious issue, and we see it now playing out uh, in, in, in real life in Egypt. So I think we need to tackle it openly and honestly. No, yes, thank you for, for this. I mean, I agree. I think traditionally it seems like, uh, and I've only been here for two years or so, that members of the Jewish American community it just exist in silos. And there's the Coptic silo and then other silos, and they really don't interact. So maybe the town hall um, idea is, is wonderful, and this can be taken up at some other stage by either al Masri or any of the other One organizations. One comment, I believe you're right 100%. And we need to frame the issue in a very honest way frame the issue. And then we can work about strategies, we can work about you know, the activities. The issue it needs to be framed very well in a very honest way. Not to be everybody should be should be scared about it, but it is a very serious issue. I think it's a it's a mentality that people are slowly starting to digest. But thank you very much for this comment. Avram had something you wanted um, to share. Yeah I just have one question I know it 
have it sound like it's stemming from an uh, investor's quarterly meeting, but I mean, what are the next um, achievable milestones that you project? Are there certain milestones for the next uh, three months, or how do you divide it? And what are those measurable outcomes that you look forward um, to? Because I, I, these are all great ideas, but I think for somebody, I, I'm extremely interested, but at the same time, I want to be able to participate in something that has concrete set mm -hmm. goals. So. Thank you. This is very good. Thanks, everyone. Um, so one thing I mentioned, and, and this actually relates to the previous question, um, I believe for this synergy to happen that different groups have to actually come together. So this website is, is hugely important. I would say that's a first step. Another equally first step would be to have some kind of conference where we all come together. Because I've heard this idea of a hub being mentioned, like an, or an umbrella organization. Uh, I've, I've heard a few different people saying they want to form umbrellas to represent Egyptian Americans. And if you have multiple umbrellas forming, then you need an umbrella for the umbrellas, and then it becomes hugely complicated. And there's a problem with just... And there's no room for the people, because it's all umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I think there's a problem sometimes within our community to want to kind of be the organization. I want to be the umbrella. I say, um, it, instead of doing that, why don't we just, all of us trying to do different things, come together in one place, find out what each person is doing, wherever there's an overlap in, in interest or objective, just join, become one one group. Uh, and and that, that that to me is really important, having this kind of a conference. Okay. So that would be an actionable Let's point. make a decision. Okay, you all invited for a dinner, let's decide. Yeah. Let's Thank you, we like the dynamism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Somebody had a question. So you have had a question for, for some time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you have a question yeah. Hi, um, I'm going to shift the topic and talk about the, uh, the Egyptian American NGO crisis that's going on. Um, maybe this is directed to Rwanda, but obviously everyone has space on civil societies, so they uh, more than welcome to answer. It's uh, been two weeks that uh, Freedom House and IRI and NBI presidents witnessed on a committee hearing um, on the Hill. And they all agreed and supported the suspension of U.S. aid to, um, to, to Egypt until further notice, until their employees, American employees, are released. Um, as a lobbyist or advocacy group, what do you think about that? Is it a topic of, or principle of eye by an eye or eye to an eye, that if you don't release my employees, I'm not going to give you the money? And also, um, on this issue, it has transformed from being um, freedom of association or uh, practicing democracy in Egypt to a nationalism problem that that's how it's, uh, the media is, trans is uh, portraying this whole problem. Mm -hmm. So again, the questions for Rhonda, but obviously I'm looking at Sure. Thank you very much for answering or asking that question because that is the perfect example of an issue that when our organization, the American Egyptian Strategic Alliance, is up and running and ready to tackle would be the ideal issue to tackle. Um, uh, you know, there are going to be hundreds of issues. Free trade, appropriations issues, I mean there's going to be lots and lots of issues that come our way, but that one in particular, I'm going to take my organizational hat off now and speak to you on a personal level because I actually have been very involved in this issue. Um, the truth is, I'm dual hatted tonight, and I actually serve on the board of directors of the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association. And I was in Egypt in July. We were together, Khaled, with a group of five of us. And within our meetings um, in July in Egypt, I actually met with IRI three times, you know, to be very transparent. Sam Lahood is a very good, longtime friend of mine. I've met him, and I've worked with him for the past 15 years. Um, and I also met with NDI a couple of times in the context of NGOs doing work on the ground. Um, it became very apparent to me very quickly and I understood the law, I understood what the law was, and I knew that they were not legally registered in Egypt and hadn't been for some time. I have to tell you, I went there with a the mindset of, oh, maybe I can help. Maybe I can teach lobbying 101 to the Egyptians. Maybe I can teach the young people how to lobby the new parliament for the freedom of information law that we were working on. 
And throughout the trip, at the end of the two weeks, I met with the foreign ministry, the interior ministry, and I had a two and a half hour meeting with staff, of which a number of topics were discussed, but the issue of the NGO topic was the primary issue that the generals were very upset by. Now, it also became apparent to me at the SCAF meeting that they thought these NGOs were doing things that these NGOs were not doing, okay? It became readily apparent to me that there was a lost in translation issue. You know what that is? When one side speaks in Arabic, the other side speaks in English, and they're not speaking to each other. So I said in that July meeting, may I help? May I help on a personal level and bring you together with IRI and NDI, let's sit down and talk. Maybe as lawyers we can help modify the law so that they can be registered legally here and do their good work because I know IRI and NDI for years. I've known people there, I know McCain, I know everybody's involved with those organizations and they have nothing but the best intention. But as a lawyer, I knew that they were operating illegally. So what is it that I could do to help the situation? And SCAF told me they have to stop their activities. <coughs> First, we will sit down and talk. I was quite shaken when I left, realizing that this issue had the potential to be the number one exploding issue between the United States and Egypt. So I came back and I wrote a confidential memo to the United States government. And I got it to officials at the highest levels. And within that memo, I talked about my activities on the ground, but I also said, warning, warning, warning. <coughs> This NGO issue has the potential to blow up the whole U.S.-Egypt relationship, okay? Flash forward, we saw what happened, okay? Um, it was not, at least from my experience, not unexpected. I, 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 I had thought something like this was going to happen, but it, it took everybody by surprise. And now, here we are. In a situation where the judiciary under the laws of Egypt issued this edict. Now, I'm going to be very frank with you. IRI and NDI and the United States Congress actually thinks that people in Egypt know what the word grassroots organizing means. They actually think that people in Egypt can understand what they are doing in their very wonderful workshops. Like as if everybody in the whole world knows what IRI and NDI does for a living. Anyone here know? Do you really know what they do? Okay, on the Egyptian side, you know what SCAF thinks they're doing? SCAF thinks they're walking around with suitcases full of cash. We call it in American politics street money. Have you heard that term? Yes. Okay, if you're involved in American political campaigns, there's something that goes on on election day. It's called street money, it's actual cash. And one particular party goes around and hands out cash to people to go work at the polls. Okay, it's done. Whether or not it's legal, it's done in America. <coughs> surprise, surprise. SCAF thinks that that's what IRI and NDI are doing. They're going around the Tahrir Square handing out pamphlets and stirring up the young people. We know that's not happening, right? But when you're not talking to each other, each side thinks the other side is doing something else, okay? Therein you have this lost in translation problem that creates a situation where Congress says, we're gonna cut aid off. So aid. communication is key. Communication is, is huge. They're not talking to each other, okay? So in the end, what do you have? You have a Congress that's threatening to cut aid off. You have a supposedly independent judiciary in Egypt who issued the order. You have a very angry minister of international cooperation, who, by the way, P.S., came to America in June begging the United States Congress to forgive Egypt's debt. And you want to know what the U.S. Congress said to her? I'm sorry, we can't do that right now. We have our own economic situation here in the United States, but maybe, just maybe, we'll think about forgiving half of your debt. Do you think she might have walked away a little bit angry? Okay, you put the pieces of this all together, and what you have is like, holy moly, what you need is someone translating what is going on here. So what do you have now? What I believe will happen, and I hope this happens, is that everybody calms down, understands the nature of the situation, understands the crisis of the situation, and implements some sort of diplomatic, face-saving, if you will, solution to this, where the judiciary follows the law and can issue an edict, something like, we will allow these foreign NGO workers to leave the country, but you can't come back until you're legally registered. And then maybe our group can help work 
to find a law that allows them to be I think we're seeing some disconcerted faces in the room. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not sure why. That's okay. I think but I, I'm just explaining to you from a personal okay. perspective what the situation is. I know, I know what's so, going on. I'd like to speak. Yeah, go ahead. You, you can yeah. respond. I'm done. I guess that, I hope that answered your question. Okay, I, I'm supposed to speak later also because I have other points that I want to discuss, but this point has got to be a uh, kind of out of control. Because well, that's not good. Because <laughs> I'm really sorry. I, I'm a revolutionary, okay? I'm not a person who sits in rooms and discusses in this way. I come from the street, I come from the revolution. The thing that I disagree with you, man, about is my full respect, of course, because I know it's only a matter of, let's say, not exact perception of what's really going on. This is not a misunderstanding. There is no, loss, there is nothing lost in translation. This is only the following: Gaddafi, Assad, whoever in the world, they always have to have the enemy. The enemy must have a face. The third party that they have been talking about <coughs> had to have a face because the conspiracy must be tangible. And where can they find that tangible face? It has to be those organizations. So he became an enemy as revolutionary or as people in those organizations. And we became tarnished. They would falsify information, falsify videos, videos of speeches with wrong translations and so on in order to prove this conspiracy. This conspiracy that they are trying to sell to the people is only a way to win the counter-revolution that they are on. Anybody disagrees I don't disagree with you. I don't think anybody disagrees in this room. I don't disagree. I don't think anybody disagrees in this room. We understand. We're not talking about anything lost in translation. We're not talking about that. good intentions from scammers. I didn't say good intentions. What I said was they think that these organizations no, are doing things they're they not. They know what they are doing exactly. They know exactly what we're doing. I, th I, I think we're going to have to leave this debate okay. outside because it's pointless okay. and we're kind of tight on time and we need, I, we need to proceed and move on to another point. So I have a question okay, good. that I would like to... Thank you. I have a question that I would like to address the, to the panelists. Now the question that I think is irking a lot of people is how do you guys secure your funding given the issues around funding and American-based organizations working on and in Egypt? So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Saha, please. Okay. Um, so since... Uh, Okay, so so this issue of uh, um, receiving NG of st receiving money from abroad has really put a damper on things uh, since the revolution. There it pr existed prior to this. People were very suspicious of receiving one penny to do anything. You know, to take a bus to take a bus to be able to you know to get to another city for or to have a, a dinner together. And people were very suspicious. And of course, under the old regime, it really, you know, I've known lots and lots of people who really suffered from, uh, from th these things. As soon as an American group visited them, the minute they left, uh, you know, the, the kids or, you know, whatever they were, the, the, the um, uh, in Marquesi, the Central Security Forces came to see them. But, so, this issue right now that we recently discussed doesn't have to doesn't have to dissuade us because um, there are many of the grassroots activities can function on very small amounts of money. Five hundred dollars, one thousand dollars is a lot of money to be able to create a, a project where, uh, for example, I, there's a, a one project I know called Sharan Wild Children of of Wild Street which is since the, in Cairo, the um, Shara Mayans, which is the old Islamic uh, uh, Cairo, has now been a place for, to, to sort of re-educate children about drawing and painting. It's an artistic project. That really, for, you know, a couple hundred pounds, people can do that, and they're looking for even that kind of funding. So there's so much money that, you know, remit is already going to Egypt that I think it's quite possible to have small grassroots projects. So. Thank you, Tom. No, I totally agree. And we're not looking for $10,000 from everybody. We're not even looking for donations in this room. But I think we need to learn and know that in Egypt, small money.